What's up, YouTube? This is Red Devilosa from Red Devilosa Reviews. About halfway through this dissection of a shit show has gotten to the point where I think it's about time where I talk about something that's worthy of a... I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! Before we get started, be sure to check out my breakdowns of my disappointment with how Bucky Barnes was treated in the show, what really made Carly Morgenthau and the Flag Smashers so garbage, and how bizarre of a journey Sharon Carter had in the MCU in the description down below. Whenever this discussion of John Walker pops up, there's a bit of a polarized stance on how and who he is as a character. I intend to show this sort of idea with the cesspool of polarization, Twitter, during the course of this video, to spice things up between the videos of this series, so there's something to keep in mind. John didn't appear until the end of episode 1 when the government announced that they would need a new symbol to help with these new attacks happening across the world due to the rise of these new terrorists. You have to stop calling them terrorists. What else would we call them? Thank you, Senator. Sam is not happy to see that the situation that he caused himself got the government to do what they would naturally do when provided a valuable weapon that has served the country for a generation that has also served as an icon for the country. And they have John Walker come out and wave and wink at the audience. Seems harmless enough. Although somehow there was this reaction. He's just standing there. Before I continue on this point, how about a few questions? Does Sam have any justification for being mad at the government for handing the shield to someone else? Sure, I think it's understandable to feel a bit of conflict, although it must be taken into consideration that it was Sam's choice in giving the shield to the government in the first place, which the government has the right to use it when there's an active threat present if there's accountability for this. Does Sam have any justification for being upset at the man that they chose for the job? Oh, we will come back to that, Jim. As for the real world, the opinions go from people like myself, where there's literally nothing to go off on for John as a character, which we'll talk about in a bit. Things like the meme about John looking like Carl Fredrickson from Up, to calling the character and the actor a racist. What the hell is wrong with you? I shouldn't have to say that it's very important to learn how to separate the actor from the character. So I won't. I'll also not humor the idea that John is at all racist in the slightest because that idea is fucking insane. So let's get on to the next episode. First, I'll talk about John's interview at his high school before I talk about the actual opening of the episode. So the writers had to establish who John Walker is as a character and provides the reasonings as to why he is now the new Captain America. After all the bombastic music, which is playing a variation of the Star Spangled Man from Captain America the First Avenger, which was pretty neat, John has his interview with Good Morning America, there's a bit of exposition to help us get an understanding as to why John Walker is the new Captain America. John Walker, first person in American history to receive three medals of honor, ran RS-1 missions in counterterrorism and hostage rescue. The government did a study of your body at MIT and you tested off the charts in every measurable category, speed, endurance, intelligence. Now there are two key takeaways at this moment in time to get from the scene. On the one hand, this is great in terms of making John a likable character, which is complemented by John feeling humble about his past and what he plans to do as the new Captain America. I'm I'm not Tony Stark, I'm not Dr. Banner. Okay, I don't have I don't have the flashiest gadgets, I don't have super strength. But what I do have is guts. Uh, something Captain America always had, always needs to have, and I'm gonna need every ounce of it. Because I got big shoes to fill. Let's also add the opening scene with his wife and Lamar. I've been a captain before, obviously, but this is different. This is... Everybody in the world expects me to be something. And I don't want to fail them. Good morning. Good morning, America. Good morning. You're Captain America, you're not. Good morning, John, Captain, uh, Captain America. And that's why you feel John McClass. <laughs> Listen, this suit comes with expectations, bro. You can't just punch your way out of problems anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Time to go to work. In just five minutes, John has shown elements of being confident. You nervous? Me? Mm -hmm. Never. Yet also vulnerable to the weight of these expectations. It's the greatest honor of my life. Um, but I, I'm just a little shocked, I think. 
How did a guy like me end up oh, here? Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> a guy like me. Somebody's being a bit too humble. This sounds wonderful from this perspective. However, this puts the writers in a spot where they didn't seem to realize that they have written one of the greatest human beings to ever live. John Walker, first person in American history to receive three medals of honor, ran RS-1 missions in counterterrorism and hostage rescue. The government did a study of your body at MIT and you tested off the charts in every measurable category, speed, endurance, intelligence. John doesn't have any bad undertones about these feats, like being arrogant about his accomplishments of that sort. This part will be a bit clear as the video progresses and we'll break down more of what the show is trying to do with this character, but to make this simple, expect a good amount of projection from Sam, Bucky, and the writers as we continue on to the truck fight. This is such a crock of shit! I know I've been skipping out on the first half of the fight, but I will talk about this in the Sam dedicated video. Before I mention the entrance of Captain America, let's see what the director had to say about this. And this is the first time that Sam and Bucky have fought beside each other and they're not doing terribly well. And John Walker arrives kind of out of the blue. To say this whole thing had taken over my life would be a colossal understatement. <laughs> and John Walker arrives kind of out of the blue. Yes, you're looking at the world's first ninja helicopter, state-of-the-art. Looks like the Book of Boba Fett learned something from this show. If you want to park your starship, you gotta do it out there in the flat. I'm looking for Marshal Vanth. I don't think you heard what I said. I heard you. I'll take it from here, Deputy. I know I've been away on Sakaar for a while. I'll tell you all about it. But first, I have someone here that I'd like you all to meet. This is my son. <laughs> ah, look at the top of his head. Speaking of things that don't make sense, John threw his shield at a downward angle to hit a flag smasher on a moving truck, and it bounces back to him in the moving ninja helicopter. You should be more concerned with creating art that is emotionally resonant than something that is like intellectually satisfying. Now for some things that I liked. Sam and Bucky were struggling with the fight against the Flag Smashers for some time, then in comes John and Lamar helping them out so that Sam and Bucky could get free to get back into the fight. John and Lamar seem happy to be there, helping out the Avengers. They give a little bro arm bump. They greet themselves in a friendly manner, offering their help. Looks like you guys can use some help! Even though they're on a moving truck, so I doubt they can actually hear each other, realistically. Anyways, lots of positive vibes from these two. How do Sam and Bucky respond? Deadpan. Staring. Disgusted. But Red Devilosa, they're upset about the shield. What's the problem right now? Oh right, staying alive against the Flag Smashers. It's incredibly petty, and the more I will talk about this, the more irritating it gets. But before we can get there, more fighting occurs. Lamar gets placed in a chokehold and calls out for John for help, ignoring the wind resistance for John being able to hear Lamar. John stops fighting Carly and pulls out a gun. Now the logical thing to comment on is how, if John had a gun the whole time, why didn't he just use the gun when he was on the helicopter? Either shoot them, or just shoot the tires out, or why not use it at any point during the fight, or even when he was right next to Carly? No, no, no. The discourse that came out of this moment was, I don't see anyone mentioning this, but am I the only one bothered by John Walker using a gun as Captain America? Steve would never. Do you not see the hypocrisy here? Let's save the Steve comparisons for later, shall we? John pulls out the gun, eyeballs it on a guy that is holding onto his best friend, which has a considerable distance between them and John. Also consider the external factors like the moving truck, as well as Carly is about to land another hit on John before he shoots. Who's the lucky guy? Back to the fight, John gets kicked off, which causes him to hang off the edge of the truck. Carly also kicks Lamar off the truck, which we have talked about in the Carly video, about a super soldier kick to the regular human chest would probably kill Lamar like something that happens later in the show. 
Through quick thinking, John throws his shield to allow Lamar to land on the ground. It does look a bit goofy in terms of the execution of this. I could bring up what Howard Stark said about the shield. What about this one? No, no, that's just a prototype. What's it made of? Vibranium. It's stronger than steel and a third the weight. It's completely vibration absorbent. Even if this was able to reduce the force of Lamar's landing, I would imagine that the impact would have snapped Lamar's neck. Because physics. Let's ignore this for a second and talk about the good from this moment. John is going to need that shield against the Flag Smashers, but in imminent danger of his friend falling off the truck, he throws the shield to save his best friend's life. My response to this is accurately depicted by Lamar and John right after, where Lamar gives a thumbs up to his friend, and John checks to make sure Lamar is alright, giving his own thumbs up and a smile before turning back to the fight. That's some neat character work. John gets an adrenaline spike that gets him onto the truck to face the remaining Flag Smashers. I like this line. That was a bad idea. Unfortunately, John doesn't use that sidearm and he just throws a punch at Carly. This gets Carly to throw John off the truck, land onto a car, and rolls onto the road. Given that John is not a super soldier at this point of the show, it's a bit difficult to believe that John could have survived this encounter. I will come back to Carly in this scene later in the video, so keep this in mind. Sounds like at random moments in this fight, maybe Sam or Bucky could have helped out these people that saved their lives during the fight before. So where did they go? Fuck right off. Hard disappointing. There was no reason for Sam and Buck to do what they did when two normal human beings that were risking their lives when going up against opponents much stronger than them. There's no rush for Sam and Bucky to get back towards the trucks given Sam's flight or Bucky's speed. They just walk in that general direction, not even sure if these two people who saved their lives were all right or not. I'm going to break the fourth wall at this moment and say this is where Sam and Bucky were done for me. I don't know why I should care about two assholes that have zero reasons to dislike a person just because the government chose the man to be Captain America. Something we've discussed before is that Sam just should not have given up the shield if he wanted to be such a bitch and moan about it. Speaking of which, after these two numpties were walking along the road, John and Lamar approach from behind them and offer these two a ride. You need a ride, darling? So that didn't go as planned, huh? Okay. How did John and Lamar end up behind Sam and Bucky? I guess that just doesn't matter. Oh well. I've already talked about how it's insane that all of these guys lost the Flag Smashers when they were on a one-way road. Sam doesn't use a tracker that he has in Civil War. John apparently has the ninja helicopter that just fucks off, I guess. As for the Flag Smashers... Out of sight, out of mind. Let's ignore the dickhead behavior. John and Lamar gets the context that they were fighting super soldiers. All right, well then we gotta work together. That's not happening. Like, I think we stand a much better chance if we all just- Just cause you carry that shield, it doesn't mean you're Captain America. You unimaginable bastard. I can imagine you, dear viewers, are sick of these comments. I know. I know. We're still a third way through the episode. <laughs> Bucky and Sam get into the car and give some exposition as to what is currently happening in the world post blip. So we got eight super soldiers on a bulk supply run. Why? They say their mission is to get things back to the way it was during the blip. Maybe they're just trying to help. I'm not sure how you can say bring things back to the way it's like during the blip. And maybe they're just trying to help in the same breath. It goes back to that scene in episode one where I talked about in the Carly video with Torres and Sam about the blip. It will further be expanded on in the next video. But something that is applicable from that scene to this scene is that Sam says something pretty wild, but it does not get any resistance whatsoever. Bucky has one comment. You got a funny way of showing it. But it's not enough. The four of you just fought eight super soldiers. Do you nor anyone else not question what the fuck they mean by bring things back to the way it was like during the blip? Do they have some sort of plan to commit mass genocide? Do you not even question how and why these people have the super soldier serum? Doesn't their way of augmenting their physical compositions give you some sort of speculation that maybe their way of helping might not be good for the world? Also, why the fuck are you so obligated to play contrarian at this moment after everyone, including you, got your asses handed to them? It's fine. Sam wants to know how it was that John and Lamar tracked the Flag Smashers. Ah, uh, no, we didn't track them, we tracked you uh, through Red Wing. Awfully convenient that they were able to track two Avengers at the right moment in time, just in time to save their lives, as well as track an Avenger that was active during the events of Civil War, whose wings were confiscated by the government, 
and that they were able to be in the right place at the right time with the people that they were looking for. Yes. Sam had the gall to complain about this, but John was able to clear that up. Hack my tech? Sorry, it's not exactly hacking. It's government property. Kind of the government. <laughs> Which is just a polite way of saying, You have no power here. John and Lamar were able to add a bit of world building as to who the GRC is and what is it that they were doing within the six month gap post endgame. You know, things have gotten kind of uh, chaotic. Yeah, well, the GRC, they're doing the best they can to get things up and running smoothly post blip. Reactivating citizenship, social security. Healthcare, basically dismantling resources for the refugees who were displaced by the return. I did expand upon this subject in the Flag Smasher video. Realistically, I don't see how the world would be able to adjust to the way it was after half the population was gone out of nowhere, and they all returned after five years out of nowhere. And even if this was possible, six months is probably not enough time to be able to do this. But if we take a step back and just accept that this is what it is, seems like the GRC has its hands full, which is understandable. But it also seems like they're trying to make the best accommodations for the people that were displaced for five years. I don't see any problem with this. I'm going to say the next bit of dialogue for the Sam video, but I will mention this part. If you guys, if you joined up with us, I mean, we no. could... You son of a bitch! Thank God Lamar steps in. Man, I got mad respect for both of y'all, but you're kind of getting your ass kicked till we showed up. Thank you. More could have been said here, of course, like Bucky being a total bitch for that stupid shield. But before we get ahead of ourselves... Who are you? I'm my Hoskins. I see a guy hanging out of a helicopter in tactical gear. I need a lot more than Lamar Hoskins. I'm Battlestar, John Spiner. Battlestar? Stop the car! Look, old man. Battlestar was the last straw? Seriously? What, was Iron Man, Captain America, or fucking Ant-Man a cool-ass name? Are you fucking kidding me, Bucky? Or would you like me to call you the White Wolf instead? You bitter old man. I really have to commend the amount of patience that John and Lamar had for these two bozos. John has been clear at multiple points that he is not replacing Steve, as he tells Sam, once again, after Bucky fucks off. Because Lamar calls himself Battlestar. And I'm... I'm not trying to be Steve. I'm not trying to replace Steve. I'm just trying to be the best Captain America I can be. They also made it clear that having two Avengers work with them so that they could defeat the eight super soldier threats would make everybody's job a whole lot easier. But nah. Fuck that. Now we have to give a reason why Sam has to rage quit on John. It'd be a whole lot easier if I had Cap's wingman on my side. It's always that last line. Now this is a loaded handgun. And what we're gonna do now is kill ourselves because this is horrible. This is actually insane. The show has given zero reasons to like Sam and Bucky unless it's just liking them because they were in films someone may have liked in the past. But in this show, I want to root for John and Lamar. I don't want to root for Sam and Bucky. Which is terrible because this is only episode 2. John has done everything in his power to be nice to these guys. These Avengers that Lamar has mentioned he is utmost respect for. And there's just no attempt to reciprocate those feelings at all for a metal frisbee. I'll talk more about the Sam side in his video, but having two grown men who served in the military leave just because they don't like two people that they don't know and that they don't like the names that were said is completely pathetic and they're just worthless. You can't even do a job with someone because of a name. Go away! John's face in this quick shot just says it all. Upset, irritated, all for very petty reasons as well. His final body language as he gets his driver to have them just leave is also very telling, and he's absolutely justified in this body language. Fast forward past the Flag Smashers, the Isaiah scene, the cop scene, and Bucky getting arrested and getting to the prison scene in Baltimore. Dr. Rayner comes down from New York to the prison to see Sam. Sam tries to thank her for releasing Bucky, but she revealed it was not her who did that. That was not me. Christina! Now, for someone like me, after all the crap that these two Avengers have treated John, after all that petty, negligent, and downright apathetic behavior towards him and his best friend, the fact that John releases Bucky, and even has the time for a handshake and a selfie with a person, is enough to give me a... That's so cool! But as you can see from Sam's body language... God, I can't yeah, we did some field ops back in the day. John gives an explanation as to why he released the bitter old man. He's too valuable of an asset to have tied up, so just do whatever you gotta do with him and send him off to me. 
Got some unfinished business, him and I. You too, Wilson. Pretty convenient for John to know Dr. Rayner, but given that he's Captain America and he's clear on his goals of having Sam and Bucky be available to help him and Lamar do with the Flag Smashers, I think it's plausible for John to be able to do this even if he doesn't know Dr. Rayner, or if it was someone else. I've already talked about how absurd it was for Bucky to be walking around in public in the first place in my Sharon video for that reference. Ignoring this, yeah, Bucky is a valuable asset for John and Lamar to have on their little team. They're also including Sam as well. Don't see anything wrong with that. After a very bizarre therapy session that ends with an exposition dump that wasn't earned, Sam and Bucky head outside to talk to John and Lamar. Does Bucky appreciate John for not only getting him out of jail, but also out of his therapy to be cleared to deal with the Flag Smashers? Does Sam have a change of heart with John and Lamar after seeing all these nice things they have done, even after being so bitter towards them? Will the show get any better? Next time on Dragon Ball... No. When we say we like consistency, this wasn't the idea we had in mind. Once again, John talks about the mission at hand. Look, if we divide ourselves, we don't stand a chance. You guys know that. Doesn't mention the assholery of Bucky from the prior scene, or Sam really, or any indication related to that. He's just focused on the task at hand. Good stuff. We get to know some details as to what John and Lamar know at the moment. Well, the leader's name's Carly Morgenthau. We've been targeting civilians who've been helping Carly move from place to place. They geotag a location to scramble the signal. But our satellites have found their symbol popping up in various displaced communities all across Central and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. We think that she's taking the medicine she just stole to one of these camps. Now, Bucky says something that doesn't make any sense. And I'll talk about this more in depth after the breakdown. So keep this in mind. Well, there are hundreds of those all over the planet since the blip, so I guess you'll have to... Look real hard. Look, old man. But our satellites have found their symbol popping up in various displaced communities all across Central and Eastern Europe. Well, there are hundreds of those all over the planet since the blip, so I guess you'll have to look real hard. But our satellites have found their symbol popping up in various displaced communities all across Central and Eastern Europe. Well, look. there are hundreds of those all over the planet since oh, the blip, so I guess you'll have to man. look real hard. I almost feel bad about a bitter old man that's hard of hearing. Almost. There is a lot more to say about this interaction when we talk about the overall plot, so keep this in mind, dear viewer. John is trying to keep his cool, but Bucky's assholery continues. Where's she now, Walker? Do you know? No, we don't know, Bucky. But it's only a matter of time before we find out. Things are really intense for you, aren't they, Walker? Bucky, you're not being reasonable. This is me being reasonable. I really don't give a fuck that you're upset about the shield going to someone else. You could be mad at Sam for handing the shield, but you have zero reasons to be mad at the person that's holding the shield, especially after he saved your life, and bailed you out of jail, and made it possible for you to be a superhero without being tethered to your therapy sessions. I can understand John getting more and more frustrated with Bucky at this point. Now we're at a point where Bucky has to make up a criterion as to what John isn't physically capable to do at the moment to show why John is incompetent. This is setting up something for John's character which we'll get to in a bit. Sam is at least reasonable to de-escalate the tension, but it leads to something else that's stupid. But you guys have rules of engagement and all kind of authorizations you have to get. We're free agents. We're more flexible. So it wouldn't make sense for us to work with you. We'll talk more about Sam's conclusion in his dedicated video. I want to focus on this part though. But you guys have rules of engagement and all kind of authorizations you have to get. This logic doesn't work because it's under the assumption that John and Lamar are unable to do what they do without the help of the government. It would be a whole lot easier to get the resources, like transportation and help from soldiers, when all John has to say is that they need this for the Flag Smasher investigation. Given the urgency of the situation, I doubt that the government would give any resistance to dealing with the Flag Smashers. So there really is no reason, at least logically speaking, as to why Sam and Bucky can't be with John and Lamar, other than the plot saying so. In fact, Sam and Bucky would benefit in this situation because they would be able to provide the necessary tools for them. Not to mention, they can function with John and Lamar, legally speaking. Also, they don't need to break a lot of laws like, say, freeing a known criminal. Surely they're not that dumb. But I, I don't know, I think it's, I just like watching people suffer. When we get to this exchange... A word of advice then. Stay the hell out of my way. Hopefully all of the Sam and Bucky scenes with John and Lamar have been shown. So far has justified why John got to that point. Stay the hell out of my way. Like, aren't you the one getting in their way? 
It's just funny to me how Sam and Bucky are willing to trust the criminal terrorist Zemo over John Walker because S.H.I.E.L.D. is in the wrong hands. Now, on to episode 3. John and Lamar are only at the beginning and end of the episode, so this section will be much faster. Oh, thank God. John and Lamar get to the safe house in Germany, which is where the fight on the trucks happened, mind you. They get in with the help of the CIA, but it turns out it was a dead end. John's saying, Do you know who I am? Like, lol, no. You are no one, and no one cares about you, fake cap. Not to me. They really try to play up the emotion by having Walker shake up, the camera moving in and out of his face to give some sort of imbalance, but it comes off as manipulative, as if the tension provided by Sam and Bucky is getting in his head justifies the scene. Hmm. Lamar mentions that the CIA was unable to track where the flag smashers are, and John says that they should maybe consider betting on someone that has a better chance. Which brings us to most of the remaining episode. After everything with Zemo, Majapur, and Sharon, we see John and Lamar again towards the end of the episode. Captain America and Battlestar were tasked to check out the Berlin Correctional Facility for the unexpected breakout of the terrorist mastermind, Zemo. They questioned the staff and viewed the security footage and learned that Sam and Bucky visited the same day as Zemo escaped. Coincidence? I think not! Lamar has a bit of an interesting line. So, you seriously think Sam and Bucky would have broken a guy like Zemo out of prison? Sure, this seems to be a bit of an odd line. It would seem obvious as to this being the case. That's exactly what I think they did. They were just as desperate for leads as we were. Good for John for having a brain. But I would say that line from Lamar is good for his character that was established prior. Listen, she's giving displaced people shelter and medicine. That kind of thing creates loyalty, man. I know you want this. I get it. But we've literally tried everything we can here. So is Langley. We keep drawing blanks. I think it's perfectly reasonable for Lamar to try and give Sam and Bucky the benefit of the doubt. Which is also nice given that they were the same people who bailed out because of name calling. Gross. Now these next bit of lines are pretty bad considering that these are the justifications as to why the show ends up the way that the writers wanted it to go. You know damn well we can't accuse them of something like that without evidence. Which is why you and I are just gonna run with this one for a minute. <sighs> okay. So I take it what happens next isn't a strictly on the book type thing is it Kat? Lamar. If we get the job done, do you really think they're going to sweat us on the how? So John wants to go off the books to get Zemo, which he believes will get him to Sam and Bucky, with all of this being under the assumption that this will get them to Carly and the Flag Smashers. Every time I get close to an answer, it slips away. It's maddening. This sort of logic does not seem to follow considering the mission. Well, they provide the resources and we keep things stable. Yeah. Violent revolutionaries aren't usually good for anyone's cause. This all seems like something that should be on the books. The government is already dealing with the active threat with the Flag Smashers. If John were to mention Zemo escaping, how Sam and Bucky were the last known visitors prior to Zemo's escape, and the theory that John has that Sam and Bucky probably freed him to find clues to the Flag Smashers, this is pretty much gold for the government. They would be happy to arrest Zemo because he should not be out and about, arrest Sam and Bucky for breaking dozens of laws for this course of action, and to take the lead that will help them apprehend the Flag Smashers. But no, apparently the government doesn't want everything to go in their way. Right. This is the biggest lead they've had to the Flag Smasher case, and it was because of another crime that was committed in accordance with two well-known American superheroes that are just going around the world doing some shady stuff. I suppose we have to set up the reason as to why John will get fired in the next episode, which we'll get to, but let's ask a few questions. Why not send an anonymous tip, at the very least? Is Walker even capable of going off the books? Considering that he's Captain America and all, People are bound to notice him if he were to go somewhere unauthorized. He and Lamar have to travel from Germany to Latvia. How are they supposed to get there without anyone noticing? Not to mention, they're not going to have access to their ninja helicopter. Seems like a waste of a record. About a third of the episode goes by until John and Lamar show up again. We've already talked about the transportation problem, and I have no clue if there truly is no way that the government could track John and Lamar in any capacity, which I think is cap but the show wants me to ignore this. It appears that I would have to ignore how it is that they found Sam, Bucky, and Zemo in this local area in Latvia at the right time and place after leaving Zemo's safe house to go to Mama Danya's funeral. I suppose I should also ignore that this sort of convenience as to how John and Lamar get intertwined with the other group is what would lead to more contributing factors for the rest of the show. 
which could have been avoided if an element like actually accepting John's offer in episode two happened. You know, because ignorance is bliss. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between your stupidity and your ignorance. Now that we've covered why none of this makes any sense, let's talk about what happened. Carly Morgenthau is too dangerous for you guys to be pulling this shit. Ah, how'd you find us now? Come on, man. You really think two Avengers can walk around Latvia without drawing attention? No more keeping us in the dark. You can start by telling us why you broke him out of prison. He did that himself, technically. Oh, this better be an unbelievable explanation. Take it easy before it gets weird. Once again, John is focused on the mission, and he's absolutely justified in being upset at the two Avengers for going around Latvia with the terrorist Zemo. Lamar has to remind the old man that two Avengers can't possibly go around without drawing any sort of attention, which is true, but also annoying due to that this exact principle has depended on whether the plot wants this or not. More of that will be expanded on in the Sam video. Also, there's no technicalities as to Zemo breaking himself out, Bucky. Shut the fuck up. John is right again. It is unbelievable. Not really sure why Sam should tell John to take it easy before it gets weird. Yes, John getting reasonably upset with Sam and Bucky is weird. Not the fact that all five of these people, not the regular Joe Schmoes, but five world-famous people are all in the middle of a busy area in front of loads of people, some of whom have cameras, having a casual argument amongst each other. I'm surprised people weren't trying to go up to them and trying to ask for an autograph or selfies. Maybe it's because of the criminal terrorist Zemo is there. I don't know. Let's also not think about how weird it is that Zemo and the Winter Soldier are in proximity of each other. The brainwashed weapon and the person who controlled him eight years ago. Although it would feel like three years ago for those that were blipped. It's also also not weird when known Avengers are associating themselves with known terrorists to deal with other terrorists. It also, also, also is not weird that Captain America is willing to give you the time and day to explain yourselves as to why two Avengers broke out that said terrorist. Weirdo. The writers wrote themselves into this problem. This conversation had no reason to be out in the public. This could have been in Zemo's safe house at the very least. It would still be uber contrived as to how John and Lamar were able to find them under all the mentioned circumstances, but it's better than what we got, with everyone yelling about a terrorist threat that the Flag Smashers, who just bombed innocent people the other day, as well as having a discussion as to how they will deal with those Flag Smashers, supporters that could be anywhere. Essentially, these people, they, they want a world that's unified without borders. So you can see why a lot of people are into that. They say their mission is to get things back to the way it was during the blip. Maybe they're just trying to help. She's giving displaced people shelter and medicine. That kind of thing creates loyalty, man. They started a war as soon as they kicked us out of our new homes and onto the street. People all around the world need me, millions of them. When we look back, all these pings are from places just before the Flag Smashers hit. Clearly, they're all over Europe. Earlier today, we got one from New York. To stop that vote. Either way, our message gets out to the world. It doesn't even matter if we die. The movement is strong enough to continue without us. Not to mention the little flag smasher girl that Zemo gave Turkish delights to earlier. Before we get to her, there's a bit more dialogue to discuss. I know where Carly is. Well, where? Time for some world building related questions. How much does John know about Zemo exactly? What I'm trying to get at is how much information is John aware of with regards to Zemo, specifically in Siberia. I would assume the base knowledge is the fact that Zemo controlled the Winter Soldier, a super soldier, to do what he wanted. Zemo is now taking the group to a hideout led by multiple super soldiers. Would this not be alarming to someone like John? There was this line by Everett Bilbo Ross in Black Panther. I gave you Zemo. Didn't I keep it under wraps that the king of a third world country runs around in a bulletproof cat suit? I'd say we were even. Does John know what Zemo did in Siberia? Like killing the five super soldiers in their catatonic sleep? Does he even know why Zemo did that if he even knows this information? How much did T'Challa say about this event? Is there enough context for John to go along with Zemo, a terrorist leading them into a terrorist hideout? John did say this earlier in the show. That serum doesn't exactly have a great track record, no offense. So maybe John is aware of Siberia, but it's not very clear. Let's remove the context if John knows about the Winter Soldier program in Siberia because the show has provided that room, allowing myself to think this way. John is going to a location with Zemo, who controlled a super soldier, to a place where there are a lot of super soldiers, and hopefully 
Zemo isn't planning on betraying the group when this happens. Your optimism is misplaced, Asgardian. Once again, more on this later because there's a lot more dumb shit to talk about. Actually, let's subvert the expectations for a little good. After being told by Sam that Carly is at a memorial, John and Lamar have the idea of what to do. Well, all we know is it's a memorial, so we're going to intercept it there. I mean, civilians, high risk of casualties. All right, good. We'll move in fast. Take her by surprise. It's great to have heroes prioritizing the safety of others. Although, there is a problem like before. You now know about where Carly is and what she's doing. Now would be the time to call in your backup from the government. Then you can arrest everyone, including Sam and Bucky, but I guess we can't think logically at this point. So what do I know? In this next part, I don't even have to say anything. John does it for us. No, I want to talk to her alone. I'm not losing her again. But the person closest to her died. She's vulnerable. If there's any time to reason with her, it's now. But no, wait, no. No, stop. Hold on, stop. Okay, I think we're way past reasoning with her. Unless you forgot the fact that she blew up a building with people still in it. It's fucking annoying as to how Sam is willing to antagonize John before he would do so with Carly. But we'll get to that in episode 5. Sam is just ridiculous, and there's even more crap to break down in his dedicated video. John and Lamar tried their best to reason with him for Sam's safety. Sam, you walk in there cold, she could kill you, man. And if I go in hot and the op goes wrong, more people will die. Are you gonna let him do this? Are you gonna let your partner walk into a room with a super soldier alone? There are a lot of holes in Sam's reasonings, and I would say that John and Lamar do put an effort into trying to de-escalate the situation. Although, there are some questions that can be asked of Sam to really consider if this was a good idea or not. Spoilers, it's not. Sam has done counseling with soldiers before. They reference that here. I used to counsel soldiers dealing with trauma, okay? This is right in my wheelhouse. Yeah, I know, and I know those soldiers, which is why I know this is a bad idea. There is no correlation between Sam counseling soldiers and this, as Carly is not a soldier herself. Also, any one of these people here can talk to Carly. It just involves a patient human being. But to really get at this point, Carly is the leader of this organization. She has avid supporters all around the world. She has killed innocent people already, and she still has that support. Does Sam really believe that he could change Carly's mind? From her point of view, things are going in her direction, with a few hiccups from the GRC and two Avengers, but otherwise, she's getting what she wants. Why would she stop when she already crossed the line? And if she gets away, she will kill again. These are some considerations that could have been added to the conversation. Wait, John. If you can talk her down, might be worth a try. I believe this fits Lamar pretty well based on how he was presented earlier in the show. Even if there is a perspective that he doesn't agree with, he is still willing to give the other side the chance to give their perspective, even though the opposition is clearly a moron. I just enjoy the consistency from Lamar. Cut me some slack at this point. I also like how irritated John looks before conforming to what his friend asked of him. After telling Zemo that he's going to be dealt with later, Zemo tells him that his associate has arrived, indicating the little girl from earlier. John gives a proper What the hell? to this because, well, what the fuck? John is out of context, but to be honest, Sam and Bucky are out of context in this regards as well. I haven't really seen anyone talk about this particular plot point before, so I'll try my best to provide the context. Remember, Zemo talked to the children on his own because Sam and Bucky were idiots in the situation to not think of talking to them with regards to Mama Danya's and the funeral. A few things happen in this regard. That little girl, what'd she tell you? The funeral is this afternoon. You know the door is coming for you any minute. In fact, they're probably lurking outside right now. Keep talking. Leaving you to turn on me once we get to Carly. I prefer to keep my leverage. We found the camp, but no one here is telling us shit. Zemo found out the funeral is later today, but he's holding us hostage with the information. You got any more tricks in your bag? I may or may not have access to a satellite or two. Let me see what I can do. As we saw from the scenes we broke down extensively, none of this really mattered. Sam never used that satellite from Sharon. Well, not until something else happens, where it's used for something completely separate from the reason it was brought up in the first place. Sam and Bucky are never in the dark because Zemo shows them exactly what they want. Zemo doesn't really have any leverage. He did. But the context didn't really make sense to begin with. He tells the little girl this. Do you see these men there? They're very bad. Not to be trusted. Donya is our little secret, okay? Can you show us the way? Do you see these men there? 
very bad not to be trusted. Donya is our little secret, okay? Can you show us the way? I'm really not doing well. I don't, this is crazy. Imagine if you were a little girl and you were given candy by a grown, whoa, 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 hold on, wait a second. Imagine if you were asked to not trust two men, which you might or might not know they are Avengers. I guess I could cut a bit of slack given that she is a kid and it might be more clear if they were wearing their superhero costumes. Anyways, you see the person return, but not only does he bring the two men he told you not to trust with regards to Mama Danya, but he even brings in Captain America and Battlestar with him. Two particular individuals I'm sure even the children would know about with how the GRC is against the Flag Smashers and all. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. Oh my, 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 my. I just want to know where the line is. Have we reached the point of stupid yet? No? Well, let's keep going. Lucky that the little girl didn't tell Carly or anyone else about this meetup. Lucky that the little girl didn't lead the group into a trap. Sorry, Admiral Akbar. John and Lamar's facial reactions to this whole situation is just gold. John gives Sam 10 minutes to talk to Carly before they do things his way. He also handcuffs Zemo to a metal pipe. We'll come back to this. While Sam is professing his love for Carly, John is doing the crazy man shtick again. Uh, no, 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 no. This is a bad idea. It hasn't been 10 minutes, John, just a tight. Don't do that. Don't patronize me. I doubt that Sam knows what he's doing. Hell, I even doubt you know what he's doing, Bucky. You got a funny way of showing it. Somehow, John was able to convince Bucky that they need to go after Sam now. Barnes, your partner needs backup in there. Do you really want his blood on your hands? But he doesn't really say anything different compared to what he and Lamar were saying on the street before. But no, wait, no. No, stop. Hold on, stop. Okay, I think we're way past reasoning with her unless you forgot the fact that she blew up a building with people still in it sam you walk into a cold she could kill you are you gonna let him do this you're gonna let your partner walk into a room with a super soldier alone and i know those soldiers which is why i know this is a bad idea bucky already knew this before i'm not sure why john saying this again changes his opinion sam asked for 10 minutes there hasn't been any gunshots or cries for help or anything that indicates a struggle don't see how this point of view can change now anyways we also get a setup for John's point of view on the super soldier serum. This is all really easy for you, isn't it? All that serum running through your veins. Which he has commented on before, which we've talked about. That serum doesn't exactly have a great track record, no offense. We'll get more about this point of view later in the episode, so we'll come back to this. After it seemed like Sam finished professing his love for Carly, in comes the big bad man. Carly Morgenthau, you're under arrest. So this is what that was. No, Carly, Tricking wait. me until your backup arrived. No, I think we had enough time to talk. You were not to the oh. I hope all of this sounded predictable when the show first aired. Sam is going to walk in and talk to Carly before it seems like everything is going well. The big bad walker is going to come in, which will get Carly to think Sam has betrayed her and then fuck off. Again, we'll talk more about the Carly and Sam dialogue in his dedicated video, but he should have mentioned something along the lines of, I'm not alone but we're not here to hurt you. We just want to talk to you. At least establish that possibility before someone else shows up at the scene. Speaking of scenes, I'm really confused about this part. Now bear with me as a lot happens in 10 seconds. Now I tried slowing it down and re-listening to the line multiple times, but apparently, according to the Disney Plus subtitles, and the best of my devil ears could process, Carly really does call John a Nazi. Jesus, Carly. I know you're not a fan of John, but Nazi? Damn. If I had to say a problem with John at this moment, it's mainly just him closing the distance on Carly so that it would allow him to get punched eventually, but I do appreciate the vigor and focus he has in this critical moment, so there's that. This other problem that I wanted to mention might not be clear on the first viewing. Take a look behind John. See what Bucky is doing. While John is trying to arrest Carly, Bucky is trying to hold Lamar back. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? I don't think I have the mental capacity to explain why I believe Bucky would hold Lamar back in this situation. Do the writers expect me to believe that Bucky was unable to stop John and Lamar from moving towards Sam and Carly? John made it clear that wasn't the problem with Bucky's serum. Also, John was the one who convinced Bucky to let them go to Sam, so that doesn't make any sense either. I really don't like the next shot that they showed us, 
It implied that Lamar was holding Bucky back from Carly when that really wasn't the case. It's such a weird moment, which I guess it was for the writers to have the team be behind so that Carly can get away, although it really didn't. Carly punches John into Sam, which knocks those two off their feet. That part is okay, I guess. Bucky and Lamar were following each other for a bit, which give Carly the window to jump up the stairs, which the Bucky and Lamar thing makes no sense. While John was knocked over and Lamar stops to help him up, Bucky jumps up after Carly, Carly jumps down a ledge, Bucky jumps down the same ledge. Sure, there were people there, but Bucky went through them like it was nothing. Somehow, Bucky lost Carly. He was able to find Sam. Doesn't that mean Carly should have been around the general area of Sam? So how did they both lose Carly? More on that in a bit. Carly gets into a room, and we get what we wanted from the beginning. Wow! Let's do that again! As great as this moment was, and how disappointing it was for Zemo to stop, I can't help but ask a few questions with this moment. We are shown a shot of the empty cuff John puts on Zemo earlier. John only cuffed Zemo's right hand while the left hand was still free. I might have been able to excuse this one-handed method if someone like Lamar or Bucky stayed to keep an eye on Zemo. But as we saw the two of them fondling each other upstairs, that's clearly not the case. I'm sure someone like John would know about Zemo's past records. The fake doctor is actually Colonel Helmut Zemo. Sokovian intelligence. Zemo ran Echo Scorpion, a Sokovian covert kill squad. As a former colonel of the Sokovian Armed Forces and commander of Echo Scorpion, I could believe that someone like Zemo is capable of getting himself out of a handcuff that's only attached to one hand. Hell, even a casual can learn how to do this if they put their mind to it. There are possible ways of being creative under this circumstance as well. If no one is going to keep an eye on him, Zemo would try to escape. That makes sense to me. It's pretty funny that this isn't going to be the last time I say that in this episode alone. I also don't believe that it's out of the realm of possibility for Zemo's big jacket to contain some kind of pins in case if he did get put in handcuffs given Zemo's track record. There's this thing called life experience. It probably would have been smarter if John implemented both hands to be cuffed if they were really going to leave Zemo on his own. Although, there's still the possibility that Zemo could escape in that circumstance as well. So the point of having one person stay behind and watch him is still the safer option. It's pretty lucky for John, as well as the others, that Zemo didn't take this wonderful opportunity to just fuck off and be free from everyone. We know, as an audience, that Zemo was not going to do that when there's seven super soldiers that are still running around at the same time. If it's any comfort, they died in their sleep. Did you really think I wanted more of you? Once again, would someone like John know this sort of context? It's a bit up in the air, unfortunately. Zemo could have run away if he used his window of opportunity to break himself out because no one was watching him. Now for the big guns. Like, the gun. Where the hell did he get one? The fact that there are at least three possibilities is pretty alarming. The first one, which is the most probable and the least damaging if it were true, is that he found this gun somewhere in the building on his way to finding Carly to kill. It would be pretty lucky for the gun to appear, Jojo style. The second one, which is not too far out there, but you'd have to bear it with me, Zemo might have a gun in his jacket. My reasoning involves some read level stretches, but consider some of these aspects that were established before. I have a place we can go. I, for one, am looking forward to coming face to face with Carly. Zemo is taking Sam and Bucky to his safe house that he knows about. Given that Sam and Bucky go into this place, they don't keep that much of an eye on Zemo as he goes around getting Turkish delight and some cherry blossom tea. Or even just. Probably not a good idea to allow Zemo to do this in some environment that he knows about that the two Avengers don't know about. He could have, say, have a gun. Somewhere in the safe house, perhaps? He wears a pretty large coat, which could be a good place to keep said gun for safekeeping. In terms of not using it to kill Sam and Bucky, there's an understanding that Zemo can get what he wants better with the help of two arrogant Avengers. If the said gun was in his jacket, again, these are stretches given that the show has zero explanation, and nobody really checks on Zemo, it's plausible. The third is more so the idea that he snagged the sidearm from John or Lamar before they left him there, which is tough to say given that we don't see the team leaving Zemo and Zemo escaping the handcuff to know this, and I don't believe John and Lamar would have not noticed Zemo doing this. I'll leave that to the interpretation. But Zemo has a gun. 
I just wonder if John or Lamar wondered about this. That's all. Speaking about John and Zemo. You should have worn a helmet, Zemo. Nearly headless? How can you be nearly headless? Like this. So Zemo died. Were you killed? Sadly, yes. But I lived. Or, at the very least, he can never speak again after getting a vibranium shield straight to the jaw. Were you ever offered it? That just raises further questions! Yeah, I legitimately wondered if Zemo was dead, cause, you know, shitty physics. By the way, Zemo got hit in the side of the face, but he places the wet rag on the top of his head? Not even an ice pack? Strange. I do believe that this is in character for John to incapacitate, even though it should have been decapitate Zemo given that he was the one who fired the gun. I still wonder if John has these questions about Zemo being out of the handcuff and even having a gun on him, so there's that. I think a better way to rewrite this moment, while Zemo is making sure he smashes all of the serums, John can flank Zemo to the side with a shield on his body and basically give a body check, for those of you that are familiar with the term in lacrosse, to knock Zemo off of his feet and the gun out of his hand. While Zemo is disoriented, John can pretty much do a ground takedown punch to Zemo's head, Arkham style, to knock Zemo out. This would at least not kill Zemo like the show filmed it. Zemo has the wet rag later in the episode anyways, so there's that little setup and payoff. Moving on, John is able to see one serum vial off to the side that Zemo didn't destroy. Convenient that this serum made it out from Zemo's wrath, but that's neither here nor there. Makes sense why John would do this, given that we have this scene later. Did you find the vials? They've been destroyed. It was smart for John to stow it away so that Jake didn't have the remaining serum. Once John pockets the serum, that's when the other actors were told to join in the scene to make sure they get him before they see this action. I will talk about Sam and Bucky in the next video, but let's bring something up for Lamar. Lamar comes to the same entrance to the multiple entrance room as John did, but Lamar showed up after John stows the serum. My best guess is that after Carly pushed John into Sam and Lamar helped pick John up, they must have split up at one point, because we never saw them during Carly's escape. I suppose that's fair, given that this place does seem like a maze, apparently. I will throw the point that if John and Lamar did stay together, then this serum thing would probably not happen in the way that the writers wanted it to go. Before we go to the next part, here's another interesting thing I noticed in this scene. The serum vials were on this table the whole time before Carly knocked them over. This means that the Flag Smashers left 12 of the last remaining modified Super Soldier serums on a table in a random room, unsupervised. Not only does this make the Flag Smashers even less competent, everything that was within the characters of Zemo and John is all luck due to everyone being in the right room at the right time with the serums that were there because the plot said so. I love writing. Speaking of which, we can finally get out of this shit, then go to the next shit part. I'm free! I'm free! Dang it!